the class dynamics of this are something that you can't miss when you look at things like pensions and you look at also who's paying for these monuments. One of the key figures I write about is Julian Carr, who was one of the richest men, if not the richest man in North Carolina. And he's the like classic speaker who talks about the poor Confederate soldier all the time. And he's a, a constant advocate for pensions for Confederate soldiers, despite himself having served for only a few months um, in service. And so I think it's it's very much about attracting votes um, of poor whites and keeping poor whites um, sort of allied and creating a white identity with a shared past. And, and that shared past, as you mentioned, it brings it to the present because our political views are shaped by how we got here, right? If I believe we got here in a certain way, it shapes my worldview because it tells us all the problems we have that have historical roots. And so if I have a skewed version of history I might misunderstand what the world's problems are, and that can let me be manipulated. An example that's not necessarily about the Civil War so much, but the issue of, of if you believe African Americans have had a fair shake since 1865, and that there's been, they've had equal opportunity, and we know this isn't in the case, then affirmative action seems like reverse discrimination. But if you, flip, if you look at it more accurately and realize that African Americans haven't been able to get home loans, which is the easiest way to pass on wealth to the next family, to the next generation, and they haven't been able to access, you know, the New Deal programs going back farther, or even more recently, this latest bailout with the COVID-19 bailout, African American companies aren't able to access that money. When you realize that, what you see is then, wait a minute, affirmative action is, in, it is, is a, a sad attempt to level the playing field that's failing to do its job because the playing field is so skewed. And so our historical understanding changes how we understand present day issues and our political our political views. And so this is why you have a when we talk about political partisanship and political and sort of polarization, it's not just a polarization of sort of policy, it's a fundamental polarization of how we understand American history. And what you're saying, I find so interesting about the uh, the kind of bringing in the votes. Of course, in America, poor white votes have always been bought to a certain extent. And you think about um, in Reconstruction, how many poor whites, I believe it was a Glenn Feldman showed how many poor whites were actually disenfranchised um, after emancipation because they couldn't pass literacy tests. And so they absolutely use the grandfather clause as a way to bring more illiterate poor whites in and be able to vote, right? So this ties directly into your research. I mean, it's the fear of public education as well, right? If you underfund public education, but and then how do you keep the whites willing to vote for you? Well, you get this grandfather clause set up and, and you create a an us versus them mentality. Alongside of this historical narrative, you also have a constant harping on fears of domination. They were constantly talking about this in the early 20th century, how if they vote with the fusionists, they're going to have black domination of the politics. But the reality, of course, is that while African-Americans had a political voice, relatively few African-Americans during the fusion movement actually assume state office or large offices. They're mostly at local level, and there aren't that many of them comparatively. There's no domination of the politics. There's a voice. It's exaggerated as a way of trying to stir up racial fears and create this white racial identity. If, it comes again and again, you see these these accounts where people will say, you've got to vote um, with your with your race. And even in the 1870s, you see this where um, Democrats are will have these will have these sort of testimonials given by former deserters. And they'll say, I've you know, I deserted the Confederacy. I didn't believe in the Confederacy, but I'll always vote with my race as a way to try to appeal to these this group that they know exists, though they deny its existence by 1900, they knew that there were whites who were willing to cross over. I mean, North Carolina had something in the order of 30 percent of the Republican Party was probably white during Reconstruction. But they need to erase that memory of it because they have to justify why you would vote white if you hadn't always done it. Right. These are what you and I both learned of as the scalawags, basically, in school, right? The, these these hated poor Southerners. And uh, it's, scalawag is literally a term for an animal, right? It's basically saying yeah. you're, you're a step above a chattel slave. It's fascinating to me is, is the other term you might use is Southern born white Republican is, is really all it is, right? But it's it becomes an insult and it's a racially based insult in many ways because it's saying that you're willing to work with 
someone who isn't your race. And so it's always about creating this white identity through history. You know, there are other ways they appeal to it. There's money, there's um, fears, and there's this historical narrative aspect. And there's also, you know, trying to convince people that one day they might be wealthy, right? And so they need to prepare for that. Back of elite Southerners' minds, there's always a preparation of the, the next major battle, the next major kind of racial war that they're going to, racist war they're going to have to fight, and how, how they're going to assure the allegiance of poor folks that really don't have a, poor white folks that don't have a stake in the economics. And so pensions, you know, you hand out cash. It's the Donald Trump method. You write your name on the check and hand it to somebody, and they're going to yeah. probably show you some allegiance. Well, it's literally, it goes even farther than that. They literally will, not only is it like, hey, we're going to give you guys money if you vote for us, but they literally will hold it over their heads to get them to vote. One of my favorite letters I found in the archives is this letter from a guy. It's a local Democratic politician in, I think, Randolph County. And he writes the, the guy in charge of the pension bureau. And he says, I've got this guy whose pension has been a, a t- taken away because he presumably was a deserter. He promises he'll never vote Republican again if we give him his pension back. And same with his son. And this is in October, mid-October. So it's right before the election. And he says, if you can send me a letter saying his pension will be reinstated, he promises that he and his son will always vote Democrat. And at the top is written by the the government official who received the letter, put him on the rolls. And and, and a reply is sent immediately saying, we're putting him back on the rolls. Make sure he votes, basically. Mm -hmm. And so there's no investigation made into whether this guy's military record whether he actually was a deserter. They don't bother to write to DC and ask the military records be checked that the War Department holds if this guy was a deserter. They just give the guy his money again. And this happens again and again that we see it's being used as a, as a patronage tool mm-hmm. where it's withheld or given based on the party you vote for. And this goes back to what I, I really, the more I learn about uh, the South and particularly the rural South, you know, those old ideas of the South not being fully capitalist, at least from a labor market perspective, up until the mid ni- mid 1900s, right? Mm-hmm. I, I really buy that model because so many laborers, black and white, have you know, it, it's a monopsony. They have nobody else to work for in, in the county or the area, and except for these few huge land, you know, plantation holders, essentially. And those people still own everything in the area from, you know, the banks to give loans to uh, the jobs. They, they, they control everything. It's very much a patronage relationship. And this is what Julian Carr was all about. I think you can expand this beyond just whites. Uh, into a way of controlling African Americans as well. So Julian Carr, who was this you know millionaire, um, he was probably the richest man in North Carolina at times. He would give money to black schools. Well, the only reason black schools were dependent on his donations, though, was because of the policies he pushed with the rest of his money, right, which defunded black education. So he would offer money to black colleges, but there were conditions attached to that. And so when you're talking about a a capitalist society, money is power, right? And the ability to control that money is power. And so he wasn't going to give it to a liberal arts school. He's going to give it if you were a tech school, right? And so he can control the sort of curriculum. And he would also have, he would, you know, demand that he get invited to give a a graduation speech where he might actually literally say, you know, don't cause problems or you'll regret it. Where he'll literally threaten the audience. Even his philanthropy was based around upholding white supremacy. Even when he was giving money to blacks, and he even said as much in speeches. He would say, I only give the money to blacks who know to keep their place with me. He's very much using this money. And so people who defend him are like, oh, look, he was so good to the black community. It's like, well, as long as they did what he said, they are good to him. This is a form of control, keeping them from getting involved. He's not actually doing this out of the good kindness of his heart. And he's also making a profit frequently. He gives loans sometimes. You know, they're like, oh, he gave a loan to black companies. Well, loans pay interest. The way that sort of access to capital, if you will, or money or supplies or resources, way of making a living is used as a controlling factor in the politics. And I do think it goes well into the 20th century. I mean, he is he controls all the mills and he uses it also to keep the salaries down of whites. Interestingly enough, there's always this threat of, you know, I'll hire blacks if whites demand too much labor. It really helps him just accumulate massive amount of capital. Well, turning the tables a little bit, I know you've been speaking at length about the removal of Confederate monuments the past few weeks. 
So first, congratulations, because I know John Calhoun just came down uh, in South Carolina. Second, what do you make of this new movement? Do you think this time has staying power? Do you have faith in what's happening right now? I had this conversation recently with Hillary Green, who wrote a beautiful book on uh, educational reconstruction, and she has online put up a map of all the removed monuments. And she thinks there's a fundamental change, that there's something is different because of the numbers. This is different than 2018 when a few monuments came down just because of the sheer numbers. And I think there's some truth to that. And I think the other thing that's happened, heritage acts are being increasingly seen as problematic. And they're increasingly people are figuring out ways to use the sort of way that these heritage acts were badly crafted because they were just crafted to try to keep people from controlling them, from being able to change the landscape to help them bring down these monuments. So in North Carolina, if it's a public hazard, right, if it's a public safety hazard, you can remove the monument. So what do people do? They make them a public safety hazard by literally damaging them because there is no other way to remove them except to damage them because once they're damaged, the governor can say, okay, I'm removing it. And so this law perversely causes damage to monuments. In Alabama, people are realizing the cost socially and monetarily of keeping up these monuments is more than $25,000. So it's cheaper to pay the fine and remove the thing. What were meant to be laws that were to keep Confederate monuments up permanently have instead shaped the way they're removed. One of the things that's really is telling is where these monuments are coming down. The monuments that were removed previous to this year were almost entirely in larger cities, uh, places that we would call blue areas, if you will, right, politically. What will really be telling over whether or not this is a, a, a true shift will be what happens when red areas begin removing their monuments. I think that this is a major moment. I'm not sure how long it goes on for. I do think it is a shift, though, just because it signals that people know what these monuments are about. And I think that's a really important aspect of this. Activists have done a really good job of educating people about monuments. And polling data shows that they're no longer popular. You know, a few years ago, polling data said like only 30 some percent of Americans wanted the removal of monuments today, barely, but it's a majority now. And so what we see a lot of times with with opinion shifts like this, is that it will be a, a spiral effect. People don't want to be left behind in the minority. This is what happened with like gay marriage, where once you reach a certain percentage of people saying, you know, 60% of people say, yeah, I support gay marriage, suddenly more and more people jump on because they don't want to be looked on as backwards. Major brands, marketing, changing symbols at the same time, it's just sheer economics, right? It's a smart move. You don't want to be tied to this. At the same time, there are still clear limits to our change. The company that brought down the Calhoun Monument, for instance, this week, put duct tape over the name of their trucks so we don't know who did it because they didn't want the publicity for bringing down the monument because they were threats made to companies mm-hmm. that are, are that drive the the trucks and the uh, the cranes. And, you know, they are still having to, you know, wear armored vests and things like that. There are still fears. And so do we have further to go? Yes. Is this a start? I think so. And I think you're seeing it also in the way that politicians approach this. And I'll use Charleston again. A few years ago here, the mayor tried to do a contextualization project. And and I don't think it's unfair to him to say that it, I think he would agree with me to say that it failed. Uh, they were unable to come to terms on the language because there was still this idea that there is a compromise here that can be had. And I think people are starting to realize that there's not a compromise when you have a narrative of history that fundamentally is about subjugation of one group, that if you, you cannot still celebrate that memory while celebrating a more diverse and inclusive history. And so, you know, a lot of people said, oh, why don't we put up a monument to Robert Smalls next to John C. Calhoun? And it doesn't work, is what we've come to realize, because it creates a fundamental sort of cognitive dissidence where they contradict each other. John, in a, John C. Calhoun's worldview and the narrative of history presented by him does not acknowledge that Robert Smalls is worthy of monumentation. Mm-hmm. And Robert Smalls, a memory that celebrates Robert Smalls, fundamentally cannot celebrate John C. Calhoun. Absolutely. Um, they're, they're fundamentally oppositional memories. And so one memory contradicts the others, which I think this is why the SCV for so long fought to avoid having a Reconstruction-era national monument. 
throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s, they fought and they finally got the monument in 2017. It was one of the last acts that Barack Obama did was to make Reconstruction Era National Monument. Now I think it's National Historic Park. They changed their name recently. If it's really about history and about just telling stories, why would you resist having a Reconstruction Era National Monument? It justifies so much. And a Reconstruction Era National Monument that celebrates freedom at the end of the Civil War contradicts all those celebrations of the Confederacy fundamentally.